When looking at the vintage baseball card sets that hold the most important spots in the history of sports cards, there's a few sets that always get mentioned. The 1909-1911 T206 set is essential to that story, the 1952 top set is also, but in between these two incredibly iconic sets sits another extremely important set in the history of baseball cards, 1933 Gaudi. In this video, we're going to look a little bit at the history of this set and consider why it holds such an important position in the annals of sports card history. Before we get into the history of the set here, let's take a look at a couple of the cards that are usually considered to be the highlights of this set. If the 1952 top set has its Mickey Mantle highlight and T206 has its Honus Wagner highlight, 1933 Gaudi's highlights are George Herman Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. There are actually four different Babe Ruth cards in this set. The number 54 Yellow Ruth, usually considered to be the toughest one to find. The number 149 Red Ruth, not far behind it the 144 Full Body Ruth, and the 181 Green Ruth round out the iconic four cards of Babe Ruth in this set. The Yellow Ruth sold at auction in June 2021 for a whopping $4.2 million in a PSA 9 slab, which, by the way, is the only PSA 9 in existence, and there are no PSA 10s. The Lou Gehrig PSA 9 from this set sold for $672,000 in May of 2022, which is the highest price sale of this card ever. I have made videos in the past about the history of the T206 set, and another on the history of the 52 Tops and 51 Bowman Mantle cards, as well as one on the 1948 Leaf Boxing set, and in those videos I included a brief biography of the main players in those sets, Honus Wagner, Mickey Mantle, and Joe Lewis in this circumstance, because I think the link to the historical athletes in these sets is what really makes the card so special. So in this video I thought it appropriate to include a little mini bio of Babe Ruth here before we look further into the 1933 Gaudi set itself. George Herman Ruth was born in 1895 in Baltimore, Maryland. The home he was born in is actually now a Babe Ruth Museum, so if you're ever in Baltimore, you may want to check it out. As a child, Ruth and his family spoke German around the house as his grandparents were immigrants from Germany. Ruth's dad, after working a string of jobs, eventually opened a family-owned grocery-slash-saloon business. At the age of only seven, Ruth's parents decided to send him to a reform school that doubled as an orphanage. The reason for this decision is unknown for sure, but it is rumored that Ruth had very little supervision during his early years, and he became became quite a wild and uncontrollable kid, so his parents decided to ship him off to an extremely strict boarding school for troublemakers. Ruth spent most of his next 12 years at this school living on campus. The school was designed to teach not only normal school subjects, but also work-related skills, and as such, Ruth became a shirt maker and a carpenter. Besides being a school, the school almost operated itself like a prison, and students were rarely allowed to leave campus. Ruth only got to see his family very rarely during his years at the school, and even when his mother died when he was 12 years old, he only got permission to leave for a few hours to attend her funeral. During those few years before Ruth was shipped off to reform school, he did play some street baseball, and it has been reported that part of the troublemaker label he got as a kid was due to how many windows he broke playing streetball as a young kid. And then when he was at school, he did end up joining the baseball team. He played as a third baseman and a shortstop, and even little bits of time at all the different positions, including quite a long stint as a catcher. But it was as a pitcher during the older part of his school years where he really started to gain some more significant recognition. In 1914, at the age of 19, Ruth signed his first professional baseball contract to play minor league baseball with the Baltimore Orioles. In his autobiography, Babe Ruth said that he only worked out for Jack Dunn, who was the owner and manager of the Baltimore Orioles minor league team, for 30 minutes before Dunn signed him to a contract, immediately seeing something special about this young phenom. On March 7, 1914, Babe Ruth played an inter-team game, his first time on the field as a professional baseball player, playing both as a shortstop and as a pitcher of the last two innings. In only his second at-bat, Babe hit a home run, and one that had so much power that it was reported locally as perhaps the furthest home run ever hit in that stadium. Despite Ruth's excellent play during his first season in professional baseball, overall he and his minor league team in general was mostly overlooked by the media. 
Even being in first place in their league, attendance dropped to as low as 150 onlookers during parts of the season. Due to this low fan attendance, the team was in financial trouble, and so Jack Dunn was forced to sell the contracts of some of his best players in order to just keep ownership of the team. The contract of Babe Ruth was sold to the Boston Red Sox for somewhere between $15,000 and $25,000. During his first year with the Boston Red Sox, Ruth wasn't used that often in the lineup, and during the rare occasions when he was used, he was exclusively a pitcher. Even during practice, when Babe Ruth wanted to bat at the plate, his teammates wouldn't allow him to, even slicing his bat in half to keep him from coming to the plate. It is rumored, though, that much of the reason Ruth saw little playing time on the field and saw such animosity from his teammates is people just didn't really like him or his behavior. Later that summer, Ruth was sent down to a minor league team, the Providence Grays. During his time in Providence, Ruth saw the field much more often, and his potential really began to be noticed by more people. After Providence won their minor league division, Ruth was called back up to the Red Sox team and finished his season there, although he only played a little bit. During the spring of 1915, Ruth participated in his first major league spring training. But since the Red Sox had two other excellent left-handed pitchers, Ruth was again not expected to see too much playing time. But due to a few injuries and some of his team's pitchers having off seasons, Ruth ended up getting a good amount of playing time unexpectedly. He ended up finishing his first full season in the majors as a pitcher with an 18-8 record and a 2.44 ERA. In his 103 plate appearances, which isn't much, he also hit 315 with four very long home runs. In his second season, Ruth had a 23-12 record with a phenomenal 1.75 ERA, including nine shutouts, a left-handed record that remained intact until it was tied in 1978. During his next season in 1917, Ruth was 24 and 13 with a 2.01 ERA, but to this point, Ruth was still used relatively infrequently as a batter, only on those days when he was also pitching, but Ruth wanted to bat more often. During the next season, many teams in baseball had significant roster holes due to many of them being drafted to fight in World War I. Due to these roster holes, Ruth was positioned to play first base or outfield during much of the 1918 season on days when he wasn't scheduled to pitch. Ruth responded by hitting home runs in his first four games. During that season, Ruth still did pitch, though less often, finishing the season with a 13-7 record and a 2.22 ERA but his 11 home runs that season was a tie for the league leader in a season shortened by the war and in an era where the way the ball was manufactured caused home runs to be very rare indeed. During the 1919 season, Ruth was used even less as a pitcher and even more as a batter. He only played 17 games as a pitcher, finishing with a 9-5 record and a 2.97 ERA but he had 543 plate appearances, a 322 batting average, and a league-leading 29 home runs, which at the time was a single-season home run record in all of Major League Baseball history. Yeah, home runs hadn't been so common at this point. He also had a league-leading 113 RBIs, a league-leading 103 runs, to go along with his league-leading on-base percentage and league-leading slugging percentage. Ruth had become a national sensation. Boston signed him for a three-year $27,000 contract. However, in circumstances that are really quite unknown, after this contract was signed, the new owner of the Boston Red Sox sold Ruth's contract to the New York Yankees for about $100,000, as well as access to an additional $350,000 loan. Most likely, this is due to the owner wanting to finance a Broadway musical he was trying to produce. After this sale, despite having won five of the first 16 World Series ever between 1903 and 1919, the Boston Red Sox would not win again until 2004, causing the sale of Ruth to the Yankees to be called Boston's Curse of the Bambino. The Yankees, on the other hand, went from never having won an American League championship to becoming one of the most successful franchises in any sports league in any sport in all of history, and it all started with the acquisition of Babe Ruth. As a Yankee, Ruth became exclusively a hitter, pitching only four innings for the Yankees during his first year there. But oh, what a hitter he was. On July 15, 1920, Ruth had already tied his major league record 29 home runs from a season earlier, but the season was far from over. 
By the end of that season, Ruth finished with 54 home runs, a number that nearly doubled the previous single season home run record he had done last year, and he also had 137 RBIs and 158 runs. On top of all that, the number of fans showing up at games was reaching all-time highs. Now, it does need to be mentioned here, though, that part of the reason for this explosion in home run numbers is also due to the specific balls being used in Major League Baseball starting in the 1920 season. The new ball lent itself well to power hitters, and from this season on, it became known as the live ball era, as the ball just had the potential to be hit so much further and faster due to how it was produced with tighter spun yarn. In addition, the spitball had also just been abolished, and for the first time, many new balls were being used within the span of one game. So a lot of factors were converging to allow for previously unheard of home run numbers to become part of Major League Baseball, and Babe Ruth took full advantage. During the 1921 season, Babe Ruth hit 59 home runs, and at only the age of 26, he had already broken the career home run record previously held by Roger Connor. Ruth went on to continue playing professional baseball with some ups and downs until the age of 40, finishing his career with a 342 overall batting average to go along with his career 714 home runs, a number that has since only been surpassed by Hank Aaron and Barry Bonds. His single season home run record of 60 home runs in 1927 held until Roger Maris broke it with 61 in 1961. Babe Ruth was inducted into the Hall of Fame along with just four other players in the very first batch of players ever to be inducted in 1936. He has the all-time highest wins above replacement rating of any baseball player ever, the second highest on-base percentage of all time, the highest slugging percentage of all time, the fourth most runs scored, the eighth most total bases, the second most RBIs, the third most walks, and all sorts of other stats that stand out among the very best to ever do it, including seven World Series championships. Sadly, only eight years after his retirement, Ruth passed away from cancer, but his memory and legacy live on eternally as one of the most important figures in baseball history. His 1933 Gaudi baseball cards, issued when he was 38 years old and still playing strong for the Yankees, have become iconic in the annals of sports card history. The history of Gaudi is quite an interesting story in itself. In some of my earlier videos on the history of sports cards, I've talked about how intertwined early baseball cards were with gum companies, Tops being the biggest example of a gum company that shifted towards sports cards. Gaudi Gum Company is another example of this. In fact, Gaudi was the very first company to include baseball cards in their gum packages, and 1933 was the very first year they did so, making the 1933 Gaudi set the very first of many more to come, gum-related baseball cards. Prior to World War I, it had been tobacco companies that had been the producers of baseball cards, and then after them, the candy and chocolate companies took over baseball card production. But from 1933, baseball cards became a product of gum companies, and this shift also coincided with an increase in production quality. The candy and chocolate companies that had been producing cards since the end of World War I had not really been making them with great quality, and collectors just hadn't been too interested in those sets. But Gaudi changed that to some degree, and they were really the precursor to what tops would become later. Gaudi's 1933 set was made up of 240 cards, and at the time it was referred to as the Big League Chewing Gum Set. Each pack of cards included a stick of gum, a trend that would be continued by Topps and other chewing gum companies for quite some time later. When the set was first issued, for some reason, one of those 240 cards did not get placed into the packs. Card number 106, Napoleon LeJoey, had become the most difficult card to get for people who are trying to put the whole set together. When early set collectors wrote letters to complain about no card number 106, Gaudi would send them the Napoleon LeJoey card in the mail, and for this reason, this card is now extremely rare. The highest PSA grade of it is a PSA 9, and it has a pop count of 9 at that grade, and the highest it sold for was 384000 back in January 2022. Gaudi continued to make cards of different sorts just until 1941, and then they tried again in 1947 and 1948, but after that time, Gaudi as a company was up against some stiff competition, and they were unable to stay afloat. They even tried to bring cards into the European market in the 1950s, but were unsuccessful in their endeavor. 
During this time, the Wrigley Gum Company became the main gum company, and after becoming smaller and smaller as a company, limited mostly to just the Canadian market, Gaudi eventually had to shutter its doors, and without much fanfare at that. In fact, in the 1960s when they did close down, they even threw out piles and piles of cards, printing plates, and various Gaudi card-related memorabilia. Those Gaudi cards were irrelevant to card collectors at that time. But oh, how times do change. Due to being the first gum company to issue a card set, and due to having a better production quality than the cards being made in the previous 20 years, and due to having some very iconic names in this set, today, the 1933 Gaudi set is considered one of the most important sets in baseball card history, usually held up in the same breath as T206 and the 1952 Topps cards as the core three iconic sets of vintage baseball cards.